Hi, I'm Spencer. A few things you should know about me is I have a fantastic family. I have a girlfriend who I love spending time with. I have a little pet rabbit and I had a guinea pig that died around this time last year. I love playing ice hockey, even though I don't do it that often. And my favorite color is green. Something else people don't know about me is that I'm biracial and that leaves me with a crippling fear of not being accepted anywhere. It even has left me terrified, I mean terrified, to be on stage in front of you today. One thing I forgot to mention about myself is that I love Snapchat as well. Snapchat is one of those great ways to get connected with other people, to be constantly surrounded by uplifting messages and other stimuli. When I talk to my friends who use Snapchat or Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or anything, the consensus is always the same. We like social media. It connects us. Social media has also dangerously lowered our tolerance for discomfort. Social media expert and Silicon Valley guru, Jaron Lanier, has already figured all of this out. His book is literally called 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Right Now. His work and others is contributing to how different people view social media, but also there's a lot more on TEDx about social media as well, and I invite you to check that out. The thing to remember is that Jaron and others are constantly limiting their children's social media usage. Why? Because social media has dangerously limited our ability to make powerful interpersonal connections. It's the same reason why I introduced myself as I did. No one on social media is willing to go even that deep. No one really cares about how often I play my favorite sport. No one cares about how being biracial affects me on a daily basis. And for the few people that do view that kind of uncomfortable material, there's no incentive to go deep about it. This is why Jaron and others say we need to create a culture surrounding social media usage. I find it fascinating that on the same platform that give us such an instantaneous and easy way of connecting and learning about each other, we're constantly tearing each other apart. I believe that everything we do is cultural. That's why also Jaron says we need to create a culture surrounding social media usage. Because of how history has developed, there now exists a dominant culture of white, upper middle class, heterosexual features and behavior. But even amongst that, the rest of us have figured out our own ways to delineate time, relationships, and spirituality. So when different cultures come together, I'm sure I'm not the first person to tell you that I think it can be a beautiful thing. I think different types of people living together will be successful, not only in the traditional sense, but also in living healthy and balanced lives. However, just as I said earlier, there are a lot of people who aren't part of the dominant culture and who don't get to connect in such an easy way. It's not just like hitting friend requests and immediately you have a relationship that you've taken years and invested time in. How do we go beyond what social media tells us? How do we use what we're seeing about how people who are in those marginalized groups, who don't make those connections, how do we change the way that these people are affected on a daily basis? I believe that that's through two things being uncomfortable, and having conversations. See, when you're online and you're on social media, it's easy to say whatever you want and to be whoever you want and hide behind that screen. When you're in real life and you're having a real conversation, you're connecting with someone. You're forced to experience the body language, the eye contact, and listen to the words that they're saying. In some small way, if both of you can do that for one another, you can know that you matter to them and that they matter to you. You can see them for who they are, a real human being. I believe that each and every one of us are striving for is to be real three-dimensional human beings who feel like they matter. How do we go about removing those roadblocks for other people that are there so that everyone can get to this point? For you and for me, probably, it has to do a lot with privilege. I am someone who's used to one of the highest standards of living in the world in America, and like I have a great family, and I live here, which is clearly no exception. But how do we use those kinds of privileges to help other people? I believe that everyone has, has their own unique experiences and idiosyncrasies that contribute to making them a valuable member of this effort. For me, it's been doing equity work here in our community. We're here today to talk about action, and for me, it's been the action of having a conversation, a simple thing, but it has contributed to my own personal growth, and I hope to the growth of others as well. 
If you're not familiar with what equity work is, I have a little story to go along with it. About a year ago, I was on a history class, and I was, had a substitute. The substitute asked to touch my hair, which, if you're not familiar with black hair as a form of expression, all you need to know is it made me very uncomfortable and a little offended. And so being the equity person that I was, <laughs> I went to an administrator who set up uh, a conversation between me and the substitute, herself, and a district representative. Now in that conversation, I tried to convince the substitute why I was offended. I tried to tell her what it was like to be black here on the island, what my experience was, and why it was important that she empathize with me. Let's just say she ended up apologizing to me for treating me like I was black, which is not exactly the direction I wanted that to go. So I was rushed out of the room. But that's another important lesson to learn as well, is that those conversations we have when, we be our, when, we're, un when we're uncomfortable, they don't always go as we want them to. However, that should not be discouraging for us to keep trying. I have put in countless hours of equity work in situations like that and others that are a little less personal. I've attended conferences in and around Kitsap County surrounding equity solutions in an educational context. I've attended marches and rallies supporting the empowerment of marginalized groups across the nation and across the world. I can tell you that all of these places have one thing in common, and it's that, that they contribute to providing communities with safe spaces to engage in this kind of conversation. I believe that having those spaces and having that conversation is invaluable if we're going to take any kind of action against the problems the world are facing. Even if you're not talking about it from a social justice standpoint, there's probably still room for you to have that conversation in your own life. Maybe it's about being real with yourself, about where you're at, what you're thinking and what you're feeling, or opening up, some, up to someone else and talking about your problems. Regardless, the only way that we're gonna start to see any change in ourselves or in our communities, in our nation, in our world, is by being uncomfortable and having those conversations. So whatever you do today, tomorrow, but not indefinitely because these kinds of things don't happen when we want them to. I beg you to step into being uncomfortable. Have a conversation, open up, be vulnerable. I know it might be difficult, but it's what needs to happen. So thank you for having me.